Hey, this is Rob, and this is episode 27 of the Folly Coffee Podcast. Let's get it brewing. All right. What a fantastic episode that was with Roaster Joe. Joe Morocco. Find him on Instagram or Twitter at Roaster Joe. He has a number of YouTube videos that are extremely popular in the coffee roasting community. He's had every imaginable position you can think of in coffee. What an awesome episode. We did Instagram live and we went for over the hour that they allow you to do. And we could have gone for another two hours. I could talk to him all day about coffee. So check this one out, man. We covered a lot in this one from coffee buying, from roasting to like roasting on different types of machines, collaboration between roasters, how he got into coffee from his time at Caldi's in St. Louis to his time at Cafe Imports, Mill City Roasters. He's now uh, sales for List & Beisler, uh, a Hamburg, Germany-based specialty coffee importer that was founded in 1901. This is just an awesome episode. If you're a coffee nerd, check this out. Enjoy. All right, welcome to what is episode, I think, 26, 27 of the Folly Coffee Podcast. We figured out how to take these live streams, take the video, take the audio, put it up on YouTube, make it an audio podcast episode. Today's episode is going to be with a legendary coffee professional, Joe Morocco, aka Roaster Joe. That is his Instagram handle. It is also his life. Uh, I know Joe Morocco. Uh, I met him when I moved back to Minnesota to start Folly Coffee Roasters, and I actually knew of him before that point because as I was learning more about coffee, I start looking up on YouTube and Googling, and all of a sudden this guy, Roaster Joe, pops up just like he is right now. All right. I clicked his invitation. It is connecting. And there he is. <laughs> What's it hey, Man, how's it going? Good. Whenever I switch over to this live, my audio goes out. I'm trying to like figure out this new audio setup. It's not working with the live <laughs> format. Yeah, I think it's over. So there's a little delay. Sorry, man. Can't handle the power. No, it's all. <laughs> we're doing what we can do. It's kind of uh, this is the new format of the time. I was joking earlier on six that like. Of all the coffee companies I follow, I think like seven or eight people were live at once. It's just like, you kind of got to do what you got to do. That's right. Got to make it work. Yeah. So I was just kind of introducing you and how we met, that I met you in person when I moved back to Minnesota to start Folly Coffee Roasters. You were working at Cafe Imports at the time. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately the uh, primary importer we worked with, especially when we started. Uh, But prior to that, I knew of you because I was just going for any and all coffee information that I could find. I'm listening to every coffee podcast. And so I'm unknowingly listening to you on the Cafe Imports podcast at the time. Uh Uh, I remember the format. It was the debate. What was it called? Opposites Extract. Opposites Extract. And that was cool because you you get one side of a topic and you debate it, even if it's how you feel about it, which I thought was awesome. And then, and then I'm watching YouTube, just trying to learn more about roasting and coffee. And this guy, Roaster Joe, is like every other video that when you look up, uh, when you look up roasting tutorials. And then when I moved back, it like kind of clicked when I saw you. I was like, oh, that's that's the guy. That's the guy from the computer. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of the coffee nerd's nerd. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. so the more I get to know you, and the more I get to know about you, it's like. There's so many layers to what you've done in your coffee career. And so that's really one I, one I wanted to profile today was kind of where you are now. And then Quentin Tarantino, it. how did you get there? Like, where did it start? So I guess I'd love to hear kind of about your current role, how that started, and then take it all the way back to the beginning of how you got into coffee. Sounds good. Does that mean there's going to be a bloodbath of vengeance at the end of this <laughs> oh yeah only only if it gets good <laughs> okay sounds good yeah okay so uh i guess back to the very very beginning um i'm a missouri boy grew up in st louis area a little bit then moved out uh west of st louis missouri and i'm a country boy um and so coffee for me growing up was just basically folgers in my dad's cup um 
and coffee was something that uh, kind of represented my dad, represented adulthood, represented um, something very misunderstood to me because I just didn't understand how he could drink that. I thought maybe there's like this age thing where it, once I, I become of a certain age, um, I'll all of a sudden start liking this horrible, bitter, dark swill. Yeah. Um, and it didn't happen because I still don't like coffee that tastes that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, th I thought you were about to say I still don't like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, do, I guess through my relationship with my dad, I tried really hard to like coffee. And I remember the first time that I did actually enjoy not just the time with my dad while drinking coffee, but also the coffee itself was my, my uh, family makes homemade maple syrup. And so we would sit around the fire while the sap is boiling and uh, sitting around the fire, you know, it's super steamy. It's almost kind of like a uh, sauna in a lot of ways. And you just sit there for hours and hours. And uh, my dad would take his Folgers coffee, uh, tie it up in one of the, um, I call it a bonnet filter, but a filter like for a, a coffee basket. Yeah. Um, he would, he would tie it up in there and then he would drop it into a, um, uh, cowboy coffee style kettle and dip that cowboy coffee kettle into the big vat of, of barely cooked down sap. So it basically tastes like sweetened water with a little like maple and smoke. And then he would just set it on the coals and just keep refreshing the water in that pot, not ever changing the coffee out. Um, and, we, and we would just sit there and drink the coffee. And so it uh, was like a really strong bonding time with my dad and just tasted the delicious brewed in that fashion, um, mainly because I think we were probably under extracting the Folgers and we were sweetening it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so it worked out. Um, yeah, that's my first like really, um, I guess that's when I fell in love with coffee and what it meant from a social standpoint. Um, I fell in love with coffee from what it means from a social activist standpoint. A little bit later, when I was 21, I got to travel to Nicaragua and work with coffee farmers. Uh, from a philanthropic standpoint, I was not working in mm. coffee at the time. Um, but Hurricane Mitch was a horrible, devastating hurricane that came through Central America in the 90s, 1998 to be exact. And it wiped out several... Um, communities all along Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, basically, um, many of the fishing villages were completely destroyed. And a lot of the men in the fishing village in particular that we worked with um, had been out to sea when it came. This is before, you know, the internet was really available for a lot of people that were fishermen. Um, and so they were just wiped out and their families were left without any kind of income, without any hope. And so the Nicaraguan government moved them up to Nova Segovia and said, hey, you're coffee farmers now, uh, figure this out. And so I worked with some nonprofit organizations to kind of help them learn about fair trade, learn about mm -hmm. becoming organic certified so that they can get a little bit more money than just commodity grade. And this is a little bit before you would see um, like specific farmers recognized for quality. And mm -hmm. I came back from that trip um, just really having a new understanding of what uh, what coffee meant to people who were growing it, how many people were dependent upon it, how little they were paid, how much um, how the lack of knowledge, how much lack of knowledge there was out there, and with this newfound um, hope that we could figure out a way to help people appreciate coffee more and spend more money on it, and then hopefully that would matriculate down to the people that were growing it. Um, and so that's what I ended up kind of devoting my life to a few years after that when I got, you know, when I moved into coffee as a career. So you get back from Nicaragua, you're 21 years old. Where are you in the country at this time? And is that kind of something you were studying or is it something that you just like kind of fell into? So I was actually in churches um, prior to my coffee career and was kind of in a transitionary point of maybe... I don't know if I would say falling out of my faith, but let's say moving out of the faith that I had uh, grown up in and kind mm -hmm. of adopting a new form of spirituality, my, my own form of spirituality, I would say, but then also um, co-mingling my um, belief system as they were crystallizing for myself um, with 
this uh, understanding, I guess you would call it maybe like humanism, of mm. making the world a better place, not because of any kind of reward in heaven that you may earn, but because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because the world sucks if we're not all trying to make it a better place. Um, yeah. So I was, I was kind of coming into that knowledge, and I was full-time working in churches, and I had already been through school. I had a degree in um, music at the time, vocal performance, and was doing that also in churches. I did and not then, know that. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> ended up dropping out of the church and going back to school for philosophy and anthropology. Wow. Um, took a ton of, you know, Spanish classes and things like that. Ended up doing some travel through that as well. And then um, through that experience, started working in a cafe and trying to learn the coffee trade really from the ground up on the, on the purchase side. So I was a barista. I then was a manager of a cafe. I then got hired by a larger company in St. Louis, Missouri called Colby's Coffee Roasting Company. Mm -hmm. And I was the I was a roaster for them. So I worked with the quality control lab, cupping, tasting, sample roasting, and doing production roasting, packaging, delivery, all of that kind of stuff. Um, what year was had, this, roughly? This was 2008. Okay. Um, and then we had um, full like fractional packing, which for you coffee nerds that are in production, you know what that is. Um, we did, you know, all kinds of different kinds of restaurants, businesses. I learned tons about, um, the restaurant industry from the ordering background. I had worked through in restaurants also the entire time I was in college. I worked in restaurants ac actually since I was 16, mm -hmm. did it while I was in college, while I was also in ministry. And then the cafe is kind of like a restaurant. So I have a lot of experience in that world as well. Um, and then put all of that kind of together and me and a couple of other people in the company there at Caldi's worked on formulating a training program, a guy named Mike Marquard, who is now one of the owners of Blueprint Coffee in St. Louis, oh, uh, headed Mark. up that. Yeah, he's awesome. He's one of my very dear friends. He headed up the uh, training program. We worked together on that for, I want to say maybe about a year. And then he moved on. Um, and then I took over that program, so ran the program, the education department um, for all of our wholesale, all of our retail. And then from there, uh, I'm just giving you like this snapshot. I hope that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> 30, no, totally. But during that time, I also started uh, helping with the Barista Guild of America. Mm -hmm. um, I started teaching with the SCA and helping develop curriculum with the SCA. Um, and uh, did a lot of the barista competition stuff, both volunteering and competing. Mm -hmm. uh, won the South Central Regional Barista Championship in 2011. Um, and then really drilled into a relationship with Cafe Imports. Ended up being able to travel with Cafe Imports to Brazil and uh, accepted a job with them as a salesperson in the fall of 2011. And I was there until 2000. 18 yeah 2018 um so seven years with them and i was sales then senior sales and director of education for them um and, and that's, that's when foley started and you're like i need to yeah. get out of here because i cannot deal with this guy <laughs> that's true <laughs> that's true no <laughs> no that's not true <laughs> <laughs> so 2011 2018 doing sales at cafe imports yep. and kind of a so is, is this around the time that you started uh, I guess the tutorials on roasting. It, it sounds yeah. like through the educational program, because that's how I was, I first interact. I, what do you call it? I started watching yeah. you in a non creepy way. It is uh, your YouTube series of, of so, roasting yeah. tutorials? And I'm, I'm curious how you got into that. When I started as a barista, and let's go back a little bit. When I started yeah. as a barista back in 2005, um, the education that we had came from either books or some very new online discussions that were happening. Um, oh man, it was called Barista. Oh my gosh. I can't remember the thread that we were on. It still exists somewhere out there, but Matt Mileto started a program um, that was, oh my gosh. It was basically like an online forum where everybody exchanged ideas and we all were kind of just like open sourcing all of our uh, discoveries. And then the Barista Guild of America was also starting. Uh, 
championships were still very new, but information in the barista community was flowing like crazy. And then I jumped over to roasting in 2008. And I, yeah, barista exchange. Thank you. Pete Licata is on. Um, <laughs> uh, 2008, there was like no information for roasting at all. There were some like moderate pieces of information that you could find in like the book that Illy had uh, published. Um, yes, Barista Exchange is still online. Hey, what's up, Jay? <laughs> um, but uh, I, I was flabbergasted to find that roasters just really hated to exchange information. Everybody thought that the information that was being exchanged was, um, or like if you shared anything, you were giving away trade secrets um, and that there was some kind of secret sauce in whatever profile your company had. So back when I started roasting, companies would literally have their profile, not just for a particular coffee, for all of their coffees. Caldi's was one of the exceptions to this rule um, where Andrew Timko, um, Jeff Schaefer, uh, Tyler Zimmer, they had put together a really cool uh, roast program where we had actual profiles for every roast that we did. They made sense. Um, they were... Uh, they had an evolution to them as the coffee changed through time. Um, they had, you know, really well thought out processes for when it came to roasting. But when I would ask like questions like, why do we do it this way? Why does this make the coffee taste this way? Nobody really knew because we were just kind of shooting in the dark. I, I likened it to playing golf in the dark. Every now and then we'd get it in the hole. And so it was like, oh my God, we got to keep doing that. We got to keep doing it that way. <laughs> every time write that down don't let that out of our sight yeah. so since nobody really understood the science behind exactly what was happening um everybody was super afraid to share what they were doing so i wanted to destroy that um it's interesting to hear because that's just 12 years ago that yeah it's it's so funny to hear you say that every coffee had its own profile it's kind of like was there a different way to do it and i suppose it, that makes a little more sense, especially because I imagine at the time most coffee was roasted really dark. And so you could, in theory, throw one profile on different coffees and they'd come out tasting somewhat similar. Is that maybe a stretch? That's not a stretch. Yeah, dark roasting was uh, very popular. It was something that uh, during the time that I was a barista back in like 2005, 6, 7, um, we had a really hard time finding coffee roasters that were not roasting coffee too dark. Um, yeah. And we were kind of on the cutting edge of that. Um, and so a lot of the um, roasts that were out there were, you know, pretty similar because they were so dark. You're exactly right. Yeah. So basically you can burn, if I bake chocolate chip cookies or if I bake sugar cookies or lemon bars, if I burn it all, it's all going to taste the same. That's, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at, but I didn't yeah. want to like say it outright. Yep. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm and Jay's making a good point here, here too. They uh, roasters wouldn't communicate where in, what were in their blends, even to their customers. They would not say, um, "Oh yeah, this is Colombia, Guatemala, and Brazil." Even though everybody was using Colombia, Guatemala, and Brazil in their blends, maybe Sumatra too. Yeah. Nobody would say it. Yeah. So whenever I moved over to Cafe Imports. I no longer had a, um, which Caldi's is very open. And I just want to say that very clearly. Never were they like, don't share our secrets. It, that yeah. was, they were always very education forward. They had an open hand with me with competing, with um, doing all of the education that I helped with. So I don't want to put it that way at all. But whenever I went over to Cafe Imports, all of a sudden I had thousands of coffees at my fingertips per year. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of different roasting machines. I had time on my hands, especially in the beginning when my sales sucked. Um, and so I was able to experiment with hundreds of and hundreds of coffees. And as I traveled around uh, visiting all of my clients, I was able to get on their machines mm -hmm. and start like cross-referencing all kinds of knowledge and taste and curves and um, the data that I was able to collect more, more in my... Um, I guess I would say my sensory experience, um, I was able to like really start putting the pieces together and they had an open hand with me sharing all of that information. So I started doing a lot of classes at Cafe Imports on roasting 
um, I started sharing my profiles that I was coming up with for the coffees that we had. I shared those publicly. We posted those literally in what we were calling the beanologies or the information about the coffee so that if somebody bought our coffee, they could look at how I roasted it, the flavors that I got out of it, and they could call me and say, hey, tell me why you did it this way, and then I could help them translate that to their machine. Yeah. Um, almost like if you buy a new blender, it comes with some instructions so that you don't you know, destroy the first food that you try to mess up or that you try to create. Yeah. It was the same kind of thing. At least get in this range and you'll cut down your time um, so that to dial you, in a new coffee. Yeah, exactly. Save a lot of money and time. It's tough yeah. dialing in a new coffee. So yep, so, that's how it I, kind of started. A couple of questions here as I keep jumping around here. Mm -hmm. One, clearly mentioning dark roasted coffee uh, sparked some interest there. And so yep. I perceive dark roasted coffee to be anything taken past first crack. Uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, second crack. Uh, what do you consider to be dark roasted? And then also, is all dark roasted coffee the same? All dark roasted coffee is definitely not all the same. And the quality of a coffee will determine a lot about the quality of the dark roast if you're a careful roaster. I like to say that a dark roast is where you start tasting the smokiness of a coffee um, or that like bitter chocolate um, flavor that you would say is maybe ubiquitous across all dark roasts when you start taking that, uh, tasting that more than you're tasting the other nuances of the coffee itself. Medium would be maybe where you're hitting some of those notes and you still have the notes of the origin. Light would be where you're kind of only experiencing those notes of the origin itself. Mm. Too dark is when um, it just tastes like any other dark roast out there, where yeah. it just really tastes burnt and acrid is the term that uh, mm. is most likely associated or usually associated with that flavor. Yeah, um, similar thing in the beer world too, with uh, when you use too high a percentage of dark roast and malts in a beer, you start to get those acrid flavors. It's, yep. I don't know why that word just made me think of that. But, and it's then the, the exact question, same flavor, exact same thing. I, I, I forgot to ask you, it, during this early stage of your coffee career, everybody's got like their God shot or that like one cup that changed coffee for them. Did you have that mm. or did was it a slower uh, growing of passion for you because it started more on the philanthropic side? I, yeah, I got to be honest with you. I did. I still did not really enjoy just sitting down and drinking coffee when I started <laughs> working at a cafe, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, I was kind of still like, this is very bitter. This isn't very good. Um, I worked with another guy named Robbie Britt, who a lot of you all uh, might know out there in the coffee world. Robbie is a wonderful human being and still has a cafe roastery down in Southeast Missouri in Cape Girardeau. Um, Robbie and I, what's would it called? Sit, uh, Dynamite coffee. Okay. And we would that sit be, on that used to be my territory for saying that. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we would, <laughs> we would, uh, sit on the espresso machine and just pull shot after shot after shot, trying to make it taste good. And, uh, we would get some really good shots. And then we started, you know, experimenting with, um, some roasters that we had not experimented with. Actually, Jay Leoski is on this uh, thread, or at least was here a minute ago. Jay actually came out and visited us. He was working at Delano's at the time and brought us a Costa Rican coffee from Las Lajas um, that was a full natural coffee. That coffee was one of those eye-opening coffees that was like, oh, wow, this tastes sweet. It tastes fruity. It tastes balanced. I can taste something interesting here. It doesn't taste bitter and accurate acrid it's delicious um that was a coffee that was super exciting for me um also vivachi is a coffee roaster in seattle um prior to that we had gotten some samples from vivachi and i had read david shomer's book david shomer's the owner of vivachi and had done some experimenting with that style of espresso and we actually had some pretty pleasant results even though it had uh, robusta in it it was like a super heady foamy crema. Um, it wasn't horrible. It didn't taste burnt. It didn't taste um, acrid. It didn't taste like a dirty portafilter. Mm. So, yeah. Cool. So you're at Cafe Imports. Let's jump back now to how you started with YouTube and the educational series. So you're starting to mm -hmm. post things online or there's limited resources available online for baristas and roasters. How did that lead to what ends up now being all these hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube. Yeah. So 
we started doing the classes there, um, roasting classes there, and I realized very quickly that the amount of time that it takes to actually do a class is huge. And the amount of people that you can impact is very small. And so I talked to Cafe Imports about doing a video series. We tried to do some videos and we, you know, we did quite a few videos prior to me working with Mill City Roasters. Um, but the videos were very cumbersome. They took a ton of time and it took me off of my desk for much more time than uh, what was, I guess, considered the value that was gotten out of the videos. Mm -hmm. And so at that, at about, I guess, um, 2015, 2014, something like that, Steve Green, who owns Mill City Roasters, came and took one of my classes. He was considering buying some machines and selling them. Um, so he was not yet in business and uh, took a class, talked to me about the machine that he was uh, working with. And um, one thing led to another. He went into business selling his machines. These machines were way cooler than I had initially anticipated. And uh, so we started doing some collaborative videos on his site. Dave Borton was a guy that he hired in the very beginning and Dave started doing some videos and then they invited me over and we just did them live on YouTube. And it was basically like a ask Joe anything kind of thing. Um, most of them were super unprepared or underprepared. All of them were underprepared. Um, and many times I would step up to the plate with a coffee that I'd never roasted on a machine I had never roasted before. Um, and, ask questions while trying to roast live. And that was just crazy. So then we changed up the format a few different times. And before um, too long in 2018, I moved on from Cafe Imports to work at Mill City full time. And I was there for a full year. And so at what point did you notice these videos? And so when you say you're sharing them, what, what do you mean by it? Like, how did you share these videos? How did you get them out to the public? Well, Mill City just basically recorded me whenever I was in there, and then they shot it, you know, they put it on their YouTube and mm -hmm. shot it from the mountaintop. So I didn't really do much marketing or anything yeah. like that. And honestly, I wasn't really even paying attention to um, who was watching it or how popular they were because, um, I don't know, I, it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> to see yourself talk. Um, it's embarrassing to hear yourself talk. It's embarrassing, especially whenever you are trying to explain technical things and you're trying to do technical things at the same time and you're like messing up a little bit going back and watching some of those videos i just want to like throw them <laughs> throw them out but um it is what it is and they've I, apparently they've been really helpful so yeah, i'm proud so, of the work that i did there so and so yeah. not not like tracking the views and like the traction they're getting yourself is there a point where someone clues you into like hey, these are all getting like thousands and thousands of views and these are really, really popular. Um, when it shifted from being like uh, recognized for the training, recognized for the sales, recognized for a lot of the other things that I had done to recognize for, oh, you're the Mill City video guy. Um, and when I would be like in Australia recognized for that or in, you know, the grocery store in a city somewhere recognized for that, that's when I was like, okay, this is super weird. I was in a different city with my son one time and a guy came up to me and was like, Joe Morocco? And my son is like, <laughs> <laughs> how do they know you? It's so um, hard. I can't yeah, imagine super how weird. surreal that is. It's very weird. It's very weird. This, this, the, this whole quarantining situation and having to do pretty much everything digitally, it kind of is... Uh, it's bizarre because I feel like I'm working more than ever, but because it's all digital, it's like it's not real. And yep. so it's kind of it's kind of confusing in that way. But I will say that your videos are ones that I found and like absorbed them like crazy was just flying. Cool. through. And your videos are also what made me realize that like, oh, if I ever wanted to do start a coffee business, I can't be the roaster. <laughs> because I think it's exactly what you were saying earlier that it's like, I pictured it more at like before I was in coffee or before I even became obsessed with it. When I first had the idea like, oh, maybe this could be a business. I was like, oh, I'll just start roasting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I pictured it more like what you said. that Hey, once you come up with a good profile, like you're a coffee roaster. And mm -hmm. I think because it's been marketed that way for so many years, that like, 
oh, we have these secret, we have this secret profile, and that's why all of our coffees taste this good. It, I think I've discovered that's more of a marketing tactic than it is reality. And so I, I think the reason companies have always been like, these are our trade secrets, is because it's way less secret than anybody would think. And it's almost like they want to make it seem harder. I don't know. It's a hard, it's, it's a weird one because they want to make it seem like no one else can do it. But at the same mm -hmm. time, I'm like, roasting is so, so difficult. You can tell people what you're doing and they're still not going to be able to just go do it. Yep. I think and the other side too, the thing that I realized, especially when I moved out of being a full-time roaster to working with roasters as their sales guy was all of a sudden the roasters that I had had so much respect for their craft were on the phone with me saying, Joe, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, you got to help me with this new coffee. And I'm just like, dude, I love your coffees. How are you saying, how are you telling me that you don't know how to roast? And it was literally almost everybody was so shy to share what they were doing because they were uh, inept, they felt inept, yeah. um, even though their coffees were beautiful because they were using their senses to guide them to the right answers. Yeah. They just didn't know how um, what the science was behind it or how to take a new coffee into the fold without spending countless hours in troubleshooting that coffee blindly. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most unique things that there's probably not many people out there like this is the fact that you've not only had interactions with so many copies because you've worked for an importer and were, were able to roast during that time, but also the fact that you've worked with so many different roasting machines. True. Yep. How much of a difference is it from machine to machine? Is it because I, I know a lot of people in the industry that are like, I only roast on this and I will only ever roast on this brand of machine. Yep. Is that valid or do you think people should look around more? They, I, I think that there are two major schools of thought out there. One is this myth that a good roaster is a roaster that you can have repetition on over and over and over. But that's like, um that's like saying hmm what's a good it's like driving on a highway straight down the road of course you can be you can have repetition but dude i wouldn't want that job would you want that job driving on the no. same road over and over and over no it doesn't it that doesn't that's not real especially with coffee because coffee themselves coffees themselves are highly dynamic and so therefore you have to have the other school of thought which is controllability and if you have an understanding of your machine if you have the understanding of the coffee and you have the understanding of sensory skills you can use those three things collectively to have that repeatable control even when your coffee changes so the idea or the myth out there that there is this one secret profile even though that harkens back to a very old concept with dark roasting there is a huge resurgence in that kind of a, a modality of thinking around roasting that I have to constantly have a declining rate of rise, that I have to have a certain percentage of development time off a of first crack. And then if I don't do these things, the roaster gods are going to descend lightning upon me and burn my building down. And it's crazy thinking because coffee is wild. It's wacky. It's different. And so you have to have manipulation with your, with your machine and you have to be able to um, think scientifically or think according to what science has told us about heat exchange and all of that but you'll also have to think very artistically and use your senses to manipulate the equipment in a way that brings out what you like about the coffee so that can only be done on a machine that gives you those controls um, so if you only have control over one thing like fuel or maybe even two things like fuel and air you still don't really have full control over your um, over your equipment. So I like a machine that has a lot of control, a lot of um, adjustability. And the main thing, whenever I think about um, repeatability, there is, there is definitely a validity in repeatability, but that, re that validity and repeatability is more 
at the point of if I turn the fuel here with this size batch at this point in the roast, I'm going to get the same result as I did last time. That's controllability, that's repeatability, as opposed mm -hmm. to this time it could be flying at 40 degrees per minute, this time it could be flying at 20 degrees per minute. That is yeah. a machine that doesn't work. So if you're on a system that is controllable to the point where the system itself is engineered for stability and you understand that machine, you can get amazing results out of just about any roaster. I liken them to frying pans. If you're a good chef and you have a good ingredient, you can use an aluminum frying pan, you can use a cast iron skillet, you can use a wok, whatever you're handed, and you can make that ingredient taste amazing. Mm -hmm. You're just going to apply heat differently, you're going to stir it differently, um, you're going to treat the ingredient a little bit differently, but you have an understanding and a mastery of the ingredient, and therefore you conquer your roaster or your frying pan. So a lot of the roasters that say, I will only roast on this style of roaster or this brand, it's because they have conquered that brand. They understand mm -hmm. it. And when they get on another machine, they don't understand it. And that, that is either A, daunting, or B, overcomes their ability. And so then they don't know how to roast it. Now, there are some machines out there that I would frankly just say, that machine sucks. <laughs> you can't control it. It will mess up your coffee. Um, I'm not going to say what those are publicly, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there are some machines out there that I would sway people against. And there are some that are kind of like in the middle and some that are like really, really good pieces of equipment. Yeah. And so in 2018, you go over to Mill City, you were there for a year. How does that lead you to List and Beisler where you are now? Um, so when I was at Mill City, um, selling machines was cool. Developing the curriculum was also cool. Um, but it wasn't, it was definitely not making me like as happy as having been in green coffee had been uh, making me. Um, with the philanthropic, philanthropic side of my, I guess, soul, um, I just felt like there was kind of like this void. And I felt like I wasn't really like when I had first initially gone to Mill City, I thought, OK, this is a, an amazing opportunity because I can take roasters when they're very new to coffee and I can almost inoculate them or indoctrinate them into how to go about buying green coffee in a really cool way, a really ethical way um, or some new ways. I can help them avoid some pitfalls and traps with green coffee buying and teach them a lot of wisdom, which I was definitely able to do. And I love Mill City and consider myself to be um, a part of the Mill City family still. Um, but it wasn't the same kind of conversation. Yeah. Is actually sitting down with the customer and holding their hand while they're making green coffee purchasing decisions. It wasn't the same kind of um impact that had you know flying with a customer to a coffee farm and introducing them to the people that are growing their coffee it, it i didn't have that same access and so um i needed that and i had the opportunity with list and beisler it kind of came out of nowhere fell in my lap actually jay again um who was on this uh introduced me to those guys jay has been a instrumental part of my cat coffee path we seem to have serendipitous um, parallel coffee relationships. So um, Jay introduced me to Liston Beisler right at a year ago, um, actually maybe like a year ago this week or next week. And we just started talking. I, I became fast friends with in particular one of the owners. And one thing led to another to where we knew that we were on similar paths. They were starting a um, U.S. entity and um, they had two people that were kind of grinding away on that, in particular, Sam Krig. Um, Sam is our VP of sales here in the U.S. Um, and then Jim Patton, who is uh, also one of the sales guys. He's down in Houston, Texas. Sam is in New York. And um, Sam and I then, after me and, one, and that initial owner uh, hit it off, Sam and I started talking even more. And it was like every single time we had a conversation, we would just get super excited about coffee, super excited about what impacts we could have, uh, about the U.S. market, about some of the weak points that we felt the U.S. market had. We were, the conversations were never like, um, I, I think a lot of people may 
I've heard this through the grapevine may think that I'm like, um, see soft parts and maybe an old employer or something like that. It's nothing like that. It's just new markets that I and Sam had seen that were very un, um, un, um, what's the word? Not untapped, but not really treated as if they were serious, mm-hmm. you know, coffee buyers. And so I wanted to get in there and, and fight for those people and really um, start doing some, some new and interesting ways of buying and selling green coffee. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. And so what are, I guess the, here's the business side of me and this mm-hmm. is, here's the number one question I always get at anything that, that's business related. It's like, well, what mm-hmm. makes you different? Yes, exactly. <laughs> which, yeah. which we work, both of us work in coffee. And so it's like, you tell people you work in coffee and they're like, oh, so it's like Folgers. And you're trying to explain without sounding pretentious that, no, it's not anything like that, despite kind of being like that. Yep. What, is it, what is it that attracted you to Listen Beisler? Because quite frankly, you've got this resume that in theory you could go to just about any importer and probably get some employment from them. It's true, <laughs> yeah. In, I mean, in I, one form or another. I was definitely not on the job market um, yeah. I was not looking for a job in green coffee again. It really did happen from a very organic kind of uh, conversational place. The history of Liston Beisler is incredibly intriguing, and it had um, it had me it had my mind going a lot. Mm-hmm. So they started in 1901, which is way before uh, any coffee company that I had really known. Um, there are a few out there, but most of them are not anywhere close to that age. And the history of the coffee company is also the history of specialty coffee. Um, so a lot of the markets that they had gone in and basically discovered are places that are recognizable as places that we get amazing coffees from today. Like, for instance, Papua New Guinea, um, Sumatra, places that um, today we would not even think about who who went in and started importing coffee from there to the U.S. Well, Liston Beisler was that company. They were the company that started uh, selling Alfred Pete his first bag of coffee. Um, he, they sold Starbucks their first bag of coffee and still work with, with Pete's to this day on, on very large volumes of coffee. Um, and so the history of the company with, you know, in specialty coffee, we have a very short um, memory. As you can see, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with words. Um, and so I'm very interested in the whys. Why do we do things? Why do we expect these flavors from this place? Or why do we, why do we, um, why is this coffee market in Colombia where they mill the cherry on the farm different from Kenya where they mill the cherry at a centralized mill? All of those kinds of like historical questions really intrigued me and I knew that there were people at Liston Beisler that know a lot of those answers. The owners had all grown up in coffee farming regions. That was super intriguing to me. Um, the owner spoke my language when it came to how we buy and sell coffee today in a good way versus how we buy and sell it in a bad way and um, some of the things that they were hoping to move forward toward. That also spoke to me really powerfully. And the fact that I could basically, Sam and I could take this company here in the U.S. and make it look however we want it. Um, just working for another importer, that's not really a possibility. So I have a lot of time for creative thinking, um, for really taking our time and figuring out who we want to work with because, you know, our time is very limited. So we're not just able to, um, you know, sell 500 people you know companies coffee per month at this point because the four of us um so being really selective in who we work with and what coffees we bring in how we go about bringing those coffees in and methodically building something of real true value that we're proud of is something i really wanted to do yeah and i was extremely impressed with the transparency of the entire purchasing process. It's it, it's a level of transparency that I haven't seen uh, anywhere else. And mm-hmm. obviously, since Jeff has taken over the program, he's the one really digging into 
all, all the people we're working with to make sure that their processes are, are ethical and meet the standards that we set. Uh, but in just sitting with you when you transitioned over to List and Beisler and going through not just, hey, here's the price you're paying, but here's the price that get, gets paid along every step of the way. And here's why the final price is what it is. Uh, that was something that was extremely compelling in working with you outside of just the quality of the coffees. And then quite, yep. and also like you were working for them. So I'm like, these coffees are going to be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, we do have some bad coffees. So if anybody out there is looking for some bad coffees, we have those too. <laughs> that's, I, that's not going to be me. <laughs> no, we so, have all different types of coffees um, because farmers grow all different types of coffees. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that was super intriguing to me is being able to find homes for, the for some of the coffees that, um, you know, if you think about coffee buying almost like uh, this is going to be kind of a crass analogy. So if you're a vegetarian or vegan, I apologize. But if you think about it kind of like butchery, um, if I kill an animal and I'm only going to eat the tender parts of it, that's pretty wasteful. And that's yeah. pretty, you know, that's like the American way really in a lot of ways. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a really um, wasteful and, and um, prideful way of existing, really, because you're saying, uh, this part's good enough for me. This part's not good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So trying to find ways that we can be whole hog buyers and um, utilize other parts of what a farm is producing is super important. So there are some bad coffees out there that with some TLC and with the right placement, with an understanding of roasting actually at a, at a deeper level, um, and with some product development, you can really utilize the whole hog in a, in a great way. Just like a good chef can use the ears and feet and bowels of a pig in delicious ways. Yeah. Um, yep. So now just time for random questions. Things Yay. I struggle with that while I have you, uh, kind of virtually, that I'm mm -hmm. curious your thoughts on these things. Here is one that is definitely the most common question that I get about our coffees across time that I don't fully know how to respond is uh, what is the importance of both organic certification mm. and fair trade certification? And what I mean by that is not our fair trade prices being paid. Is it grown organically? There are, th those are obvious, but the actual certification itself, how important are these things in the process? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of both. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big proponent also of Rainforest Alliance, which is kind of like a precursor to organic. Um, so think about it this way. Think about a mountain. A mountain is shaped kind of like a pyramid. And at the very top of that mountain is the best growing conditions, or maybe like toward the top of that mountain. But as you go up the mountain, you run out of real estate really quickly. Mm -hmm. And the best growing conditions are usually owned by somebody that has the most money and is getting the most money per acre for their farm. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you go down a little bit more, maybe they're growing medium high grade. If you go down a little bit more, they're growing lower grade. And then all the way down at the bottom, they're just growing basically robust filler coffees that are really super nasty. So the farms that are growing the Robusta, generally those are huge plantation style farms that are on flat land that can utilize all kinds of equipment and uh, they have tons of water, tons of sunlight, very hot, um, tons of carbon dioxide, which is what plants breathe. Um, whereas that middle group, they both are lacking in funds. They're lacking in um, resources in terms of fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, things like that. They're lacking in the ability to grow really, really high quality coffees that would yield sustainably um, founded pricing. Mm -hmm. And so they've got to do something to make a little bit more money. Well, luckily, the value proposition for organic is that if you are organic certified, you get more money per pound right mm -hmm. from the beginning. And if you are fair trade certified, Fair trade will, it basically requires you to be a member of an organization as a democratic member. So in other words, you have just as much power in the ownership 
of a cooperative as every other member in that cooperative to where mm. you can vote on um, how much you get per pound on your coffee. You can vote for who is going to be the leader. You can vote for, you know, milling costs and all of these other things, which is awesome. But mm. more than that, it if you are looking at a thousand farmers that are unified and working out of one mill, they have access to the market. They have access to education and other kinds of funding. They have access to probably an agronomist. They have access to all kinds of things. So that's called equity. That's an empowerment movement. And so since they have access and they have a democratic vote in a system that looks very socialist from the outside because everybody kind of shares equally, uh, they don't share equally necessarily because if you bring 100 pounds and I bring 200 pounds, I'm going to make twice as much money as you. But they are sharing in that I have a vote in how this money gets split. And if we make the same amount of coffee, we get the same amount of money. So this is like social democracy 101. Um, and it is working in a very powerful way in coffee cooperatives. If you're organic certified, you get an extra bonus on top of that fair trade bonus if you are fair trade certified as well. On the other side of the equation, um, for if you think about it from an ecological standpoint, um, and I'm not talking like just general global warming or um, anything like that from a global scale, on a microscopic scale within your farm soil, there are billions of, um, like in every cubic centimeter, which is a cc, there are billions of microbials that are interacting together, eating each other, eating the other stuff that's rotting in the soil, and basically expelling all kinds of nutrition that is available for plants to use. Well, if you go in with a chemical fertilizer, a chemical pesticide, and you spray that over your farm, what happens is it kills all of that microbial activity that's happening in your soil, and it makes your farm completely dependent upon chemical fertilizers. And that washes off. The majority of what you spray on a farm does not actually get used by a plant. It actually goes into the water system and into the soil networks, and it kills. There's mass die-off. And what ends up happening is what's called monoculture. And monoculture is the antithesis of life. So in other words, if we were to fly to another planet and find life there, and there's only one creature that we find, scientists would not consider that to be the natural life on that on that planet because mm -hmm. life requires other life you have to have a biome of diversity if you find a biome of diversity then we know that that planet basically sustains life most of the farms that are out there that are dependent upon chemical fertilizers are actually um monocultures in other words if you take the fertilizers away even the dependent plants would die and that's yeah. super tragic for huge swaths of, you know, subtropical climate. So by using organic fertilizers, organic pesticides, where they can be used, you create little, like, it's like a patchwork quilt of areas where if you don't use them, no coffee will survive. So you have to use chemicals. Um, and so those are kind of broken up by the organic farms. So then if you have... Um, let's say migratory birds, migratory insects, other kinds of wildlife, the biome that is in the soil, all of that has at least these like islands or archipelagos where they can exist within an ecosystem to where when a farmer does do away with their chemical fertilizers, then the natural environment around can re-inhabit and take back over that farm. That's a beautiful thing. So organic has to exist. It's almost like the same thing in a reverse way of um, how we think about inoculation in, in, um, against disease. If at least 90% or 80% of a community is inoculated, then nobody in the community is going to get that illness because they are protecting the people that are not able to get the um, inoculation. So that's kind of how I think about it. I think it's a very, very positive thing. I don't think that it's... Um, a joke like a lot of people make it out to be i yeah. do think that there are a lot of farmers that cheat that's that have been organic certified and that are that we say are organic but they are maybe slipping a little chemicals here and there and personally i'm kind of like well if that's what you have to do to feed your kids 
I would maybe do that, but um, yeah. So I try not to be judgmental at the same time because I can't prove either way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are the pros so and cons. So what you're saying is chemical fertilizer to the biome of a coffee farm is like the standard Western American diet to the gut biome of us. <laughs> that's that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, if we just ate um, salt, basically. Yeah. Salt's something that our body needs. It's something that we would die without, but if we just crush it, our gut dies and then we die. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the most common mistake you see people making while roasting coffee? Not trusting their gut. Hmm. Speaking of the gut. Yeah, not yeah. trusting themselves. Um, and they keep in the back of their head some rule that somebody said online that has no bearing on their machine with their coffee at that time. And they try to force their coffee into that rule and it's just not gonna yield good results. It's gonna lead them down a path of self doubt and questioning and they're not gonna be free enough to do what tastes best. So with that in mind, how much should people lean on tried and true roasting rules versus kind of the art of roasting or smelling and sensing and tasting along the way? So I have, a, I have one roasting rule that I require everybody to follow, and that roasting rule is do what tastes good. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you're starting, you don't have that lexicon developed. Yeah. And so, yes, also, Jay, yes, also maintenance. Please clean and maintain your equipment. <laughs> Uh, but when it comes to the aesthetics of roasting, do it taste good. Um, but if you don't have that lexicon or that experience built and you're like, I don't even know what tastes good or how to know if my coffee tastes good or how to know if it tastes better um, than it did before, you have to develop those skills over time. And that's why you have a lot of the quote unquote rules out there is there to help you al almost like um, – like train rails, you start on the rails, you do that for a while, you keep tasting and keep tasting, and then you can break the rules. As a musician, whenever I went to music school, um, I learned musical theory where you learn the quote unquote rules of writing a song. And I was pissed. Yeah. I was like, this is music. You can't tell me the rules to music. Um, but there are rules, and when you mm -hmm. understand those fundamental rules, um, then you can start to branch off from those. Now, the rules, are, the rules of music are a little bit older and a little bit more tried and true than the rules of roasting. Uh, the rules of roasting are developing constantly. And right. I know that a lot of the, um, maybe let's say the, the top consultants out there would say handle their rules, quote unquote, with care. And that their rules have exceptions. I know that for a fact. I've talked, I'm friends with these guys, and they're all very open about that. But you kind of got to start somewhere. So it's kind of like training wheels. Yeah. And I think roasters a lot of times want to just immediately get their um, machine and start acting like they're a BMX rider on a motorcycle. And mm -hmm. it's just not possible until you've learned basically how to ride your bike and how to maintain it and all of that kind of stuff. So. Well, yes. and, and that that's can really be where bad habits form is if you're not listening to any rules and you're manipulating multiple variables of a roast at once, if you're manipulating one variable at once, you can say much more confidently, that's why this one is smelling, tasting this way. Whereas if you're adjusting multiple variables at once, you go, this one tastes way better, but you don't really know why. So you go, well, we yeah. have to do all of these variables this way now, when in reality, half the things you did could be making it better, and a couple things you changed could be making it worse. So even though overall it's better than what it was, it's not mm -hmm. the best it could be. And that's kind of a difficult thing to learn because you realize that it's like the unsexy stuff of manipulating small variables at a time, and it's slow and arduous that over time is gonna make it so that you can do those things. And it's, you, you start to learn how variables interact with each other. And that's, that's where I think you get people like yourself where you go, well, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. and it's like, well, you can't build a gut feeling until you kind of know why things interact in a way. That's so true. Uh, 
Yeah, and that, that's I think that's true with anything, not just roasting, yep. but like to get to a level where you can wing it, like you, you have to have the foundation built. And roasting to me is like it's there's a very distinct personality type that's that can do that. And I learned quickly that I don't think I'm that personality type. My short my attention span's way too short. I need to be doing I need to be doing ten different things all the time. Whereas mm-hmm. a roaster, it's like you have to have laser laser focus on one variable at a time and it has to be an intense passion because it's like you said that that, i mean roasting the same coffee over and over that's not what people picture a coffee roaster like they picture like the for sure curtain mustache and like you know doing like all these crazy coffees different coffee every batch but it's really the people that are doing the boring stuff more yeah Um, it's a factory job yeah, and that it's it's the same in a lot of food too. You know, like uh, line cooks, uh, shift brewers. That's like you get these really sexy jobs that like movies and TV shows portray them to be this thing. And then when you really get into it, it's like it is extremely technical and a lot of repetition. But it's kind of uh, it's that saying that I don't fear the person that uh, knows ten thousand different punches. I fear the person that's practiced one punch ten thousand times. It's kind of a similar thing with roasting that it's like, you know, I can roast you a good batch of coffee, but I could take that same coffee, roast it again. It probably won't turn out the same. And when you ask why, I'll be like, I'm not completely sure, but I can explain pretty well why. Whereas Jeff could sit down and apparently uh, Instagram live kicks you off at an hour. So we got kicked off of that with Joe. We'll see if he sees that I'm back on here. If not, he just joined here. Well, let's see if he joins back in here. We can wrap this episode up. Here we go. <gasps> Waiting for Roaster Joe to come back in. All right. Apparently, we've been on for an hour. We're back on. I knew wow, that you, hour I knew went fast. You, uh, man, I know it kicks you off after an hour. And I, I thought we just lost connection and it said it was done. I was like, no way. Um <laughs> Anyway, yeah, kind of back to that whole point that it's like, it really is, I think a lot of people perceive coffee roasting uh, to be kind of what it's marketed as, that it's like this kind of like, I don't know, it's just purely senses, or it's like these secret things that no one knows. And that's kind of what's awesome about what you've been able to do in teaching roasting and teaching roasting theory is that it's like, it do what tastes good. Yeah. Uh, But I I think I've noticed that a lot of people like you said, they've been taught how to do something and they go, it tastes like this when I do that. But when you get down to the technical level of why it does it taste like that, what's chemically, what, or what, what compounds are changing in the coffee to cause that, um, I, I think there's a lot of people that that's where you lose a big portion of people roasting coffee. Um, yep. and a lot of it has to do with business is hard too, that it, it, it's hard to run a, a cafe, a shop, a roaster, and still pursue to that level. Yeah. Um, let's see, last one here. I want this to be more of a customer-facing one. What are your thoughts? I know this was big. It's not as big anymore, but what are your thoughts of ristretto versus espresso? <laughs> well, I would say ristretto is a style of espresso. Um, mm-hmm. And for certain roast, a ristretto is actually preferred to, like, you know, a 50... 50- 50 volume or a double volume or um so if you like a really super intense coffee flavor um the ristretto is going to be something you prefer if you like a more delicate nuanced coffee flavor then you're probably going to pull your shot a lot longer and it really does come down to taste that's one of the things not to backtrack too much but the nuance of the rule, do what tastes good, is that from a marketing perspective, if you at Folly Coffee do what tastes good to you, since your taste is so diversified from other people's tastes, that will also inform your coffee, and your coffee will therefore deviate from other companies. So from a marketing perspective, you develop something that is unique to your own Um, way of doing things and so uniqueness is very important i think and if you follow um, a rule on how to roast exactly to a specific style instead of following your own instincts and what you actually like personally and want to present like a a chef would 
then you kind of fall almost into a pattern with everybody else and you become just like um, another chain store with other chains of ownership. So doing that, whether it comes to the roasted coffee or the extracted coffee, um, it's important to follow your own palate. Um, I saw a question pop up too. If a customer were to ask you if you could do a dark roast for them, would you do it if that co- if that coffee was like a really expensive high grade coffee? Um, is the customer always right? And the answer to that for me personally is if the customer is paying me to do a dark roast and they're going to buy all of that dark roast that I do, they cannot be wrong in coming to me saying I want you to be the person that takes my money. That's not wrong. Yeah. And yes, I would absolutely do that. Uh, right and wrong in terms of aesthetics is not a moral question of right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an aesthetic question of pre- preference or not preference. Um, now, if they were to come to me and say, you should roast all your coffee dark, then they're probably capable of being wrong if I don't think that that's the aesthetic that I want for my company. But that affects other people in and the company overall. If it's just for them, there's no morality in how you roast. Yeah. And that's a, uh, we ran into that exact scenario that as we were expanding our wholesale offering and kind of cafe restaurant side, that's like, Hey, we have to have a dark roast. Yep. And it's not so much a moral dilemma, but on like the marketing side, one problem that you can run into is that if you're doing a dark roast for a customer and they're marketing that, Hey, we're serving folly coffee. A lot of people's first interaction with Folly Coffee will be a dark roasted coffee. And so that can be, from a branding side, a difficult thing that there might be scenarios in which dark roasting coffee as a private label for someone that's willing to buy all of it's an option. But the way we approached it was, what is it about dark roasts that people like? And again, I know the customer is always right, but I think a lot of people don't know what it is they like about coffees and they go, well, I like a coffee that's strong. And so I like a really nice dark roast. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of took the approach. It's like, well, can we get that intensity of flavor without the bad parts of the bitterness? And that goes back to your point earlier that, Hey, if you can roast coffees darker, if it's a high quality coffee and you're very careful with your roasting, I, I would argue in a lot of ways, dark roasting coffees can be more challenging. Definitely. Uh, yep. I mean, when you think about it, it's, it's a longer time to mess up a coffee. <laughs> yep. Um, and your, your reactionary rates speed up at temp. So as you're at that higher temperature later in the roast, instead of there being, you know, I mean, basically, if you think about an exponential curve, as you're roasting early in the roast, there's no chemical change. Later in the roast, there's a lot of chemical change. And at the end, you have tons and tons of chemical change and that chemical change is harder to bring to a, a stopping point at the exact same point every time. So your darker roast can taste subtly different unless they're all the way burnt. If they're on that edge of being a good roast and dark, which does exist, um, they are super hard to replicate every time. Um, last question here. Um, you were saying when you're starting 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, not a lot of collaboration between roasters, not a lot of transparency, mm-hmm. everybody holding their cards very close to their chest that we don't want to give away any secrets or any information about how we roast. Do you still find that to be true, especially if I'm talking like third wave style coffee or have you noticed collaboration increasing? Yeah, there's definitely way more conversations now. I mean, Now the majority of roasters out there are openly communicating with other roasters. There is kind of a cutoff whenever it comes to your larger companies. They're a little bit more cloistered, but uh, for the majority of companies that are out there, they're sharing all kinds of things, asking all kinds of questions. There's still limits to what they get into, but overall collaboration is, is opened up. Yeah, and I, I scream this from the hilltops that it's like, this is what craft beer did really, really well beginning Definitely. in the early 2000s is they didn't say, drink my beer. They said, drink craft beer. Yep. And so people wanted to go find all the craft beer they could find. Whereas I haven't seen that as much in coffee, Mm-mm. but my thought process on transparency in roasting and business or just anything is that the more transparency all these specialty roasters could have, if we can all make each other create better products one we're going to push each other to get better 
And then two, we're going to further separate what we're producing versus kind of your mass market coffees. And mm -hmm. the more the separation there is and the better everyone is getting, the more excitement there will be about coffee in general. <laughs> yep. Because it's like, it's not the, the small slice of coffee nerds like you and me that's going to change the tide of coffee drinking culture. It's this large, large population of people drinking just your mass marketed coffees that have never even known this world exists. So I'm like, definitely the, the better we can all make each other. I want somebody to drink folly and go, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize I liked specialty coffee. I didn't realize I liked high end coffee, whatever you want to try it. I want to go out and try all of them now. Cause yep. that's just like, there's enough room for everybody. And so it's exciting to hear that there is more collaboration. I think that the digital side definitely has helped that uh, a bit of a catalyst, if you will. Uh, but I mean, People like you and what you're doing and what you've done is a huge part of that. Because oh, I think you. I think that the, the information you're putting out there and your transparency is not only helpful to people like me to for <laughs> ironically taught me I, I shouldn't be the roaster, but that's <laughs> that was huge in the development of folly. Uh, was that I need to be the ones tasting the coffee. I should be doing other things outside of that. Uh, but I think you've introduced more people to wanting to learn about coffee or learning to roast than I mean, most anybody else in this country, there's like a small group. Thank of people. you. So it, it's awesome. I think like the way you do business, who you are as a person is, I have so much respect for it. Uh, and just the, the way you are willing to lend yourself to any situation, even when I'm some weird guy, like just starting some coffee roaster to just like our, our personal interactions have been very important to me. And just the oh, fact that you go so on much, onto this, like during a, a weird time and it's 9, 10 PM now. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, of course I'll do it. I was like, yeah, of course he will. But I don't take that for granted. I really appreciate your time. And you uh, yeah, thanks for I hopping Thank you to on. everybody who uh, tuned in today too. I saw a lot of uh, names on here of some really great friends and, and good people in the industry. Um, I mean, Elkin Guzman is on right now. What's up, Elkin? That's awesome. <laughs> uh, Jay and Pete. I mean, yeah, some really good people out there. So thank you all for tuning in. And if I didn't name you, I apologize. You're, you're awesome too, I'm sure. <laughs> Unless you're not, then you're just not. Um, yeah, I'll be putting, I'll be taking the video, putting it on YouTube. I'll be putting the audio out on podcast format on the Folly Coffee podcast. So if anybody is here, didn't catch a part of our conversation, this will be released on Sunday. So just stay tuned if you want to catch any part of the conversation that you weren't able to catch. But thank you so much for your time, man. Really good to- Thank you all. Have, I, have we seen each other now? I don't know how this works. Uh, virtual hug, man. All right, man. Have a good one. <laughs> all right. See ya.